All right. Good morning, everybody. And um, I'm really excited to introduce Bill Ryan. He is a senior associate at Zeta Associates. So I guess he's one of the Zeta Associates. Um, and he was formerly a professor at the University of Arizona. And um, he uh, and I go, go back a long way working on the same problems in coding theory. Um, and we actually both got excited about convolutional codes with CRCs really at the same time. I remember very well um, standing in the lobby at the information theory, the ITA conference. Um, and Bill came up to me and was talking about his ideas. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, he's going to do exactly what I'm going to do. We have to, so we. <laughs> I, I um, remember, yeah. And, and so we're both on this uh, journey and, and now on that journey together. Um, and one of the key issues uh, of this, so it turns out that, you know, a convolutional code with a CRC and list decoding is really good. But if it's a tail biting convolutional code, it's even better because you don't, that overhead matters at those low block lengths. But it turns out if you're not clever, um, decoding that tail biting convolutional code with list decoding can be much more complex than decoding a zero terminated code um, with list decoding and using the Viterbi approach. So that brings us to today's talk, where Bill is going to talk about using the FANO algorithm, which is just different. It actually predates Viterbi and, and could be a better choice for us. And so I'm really excited. This is very, it's directly applicable to things that we really care about in CSL. So we're really excited to have Bill tell us today about using the FANO algorithm for short message convolutional codes. Take it from here, Bill. OK. Thanks, Rick, for the uh, introduction. Um, so this is a, a bit of a status report um, on uh, FANO decoding for sh short message convolutional codes. Um, I actually asked Rick if I could give this seminar in the hopes of getting him interested in, in, in helping me uh, polish off this problem. But you, you'll see there are some nice results here, but there are some open problems. Um, which I'll tell you about. And uh, let me see, I'm thinking, I'm gonna do full screen and tell me if, does that look better or is it? Yeah, that looks better, that's fantastic. Okay, so uh, for me, it's blocking out some things, but you guys can all see it, right? Yeah. Is, is it, okay, so, it's not I essential. This, if you wanted to go to not full screen, that was okay. This is better, but the other one was okay. It didn't. Okay, let's try this. Um, so I thought this was gonna be a great first slide before my outline. Um, what it is, it's a memory for zero terminated convolutional code with a message size of 150. Memory and 14. I, of the memory 14, thank you, yeah. And, and I'm plotting the frame error rate um, for both Viterbi and Fano against the standard signal noise ratio, EB over and zero. And you can see the performance is essentially identical for, the bo for both. And I've also included the union up and upper bound for that code to show that, okay, they both um, are very tight with a maximum likelihood uh, decoder. Um, but what's the most interesting, which besides the fact that the Phantom and Viterbi have nearly essential performances, if, if you'll, you'll see it, um, well, at, at this signal noise ratio, 1.5, uh, Phantom is two times faster. Um, anyone will take that, but look at this at 2 dB, it's 30 times faster, not 10, 30. And then down here at, at uh, a frame error rate of 10 to minus three, it's 250 times faster. Um, and it's the same program, or this is me, and then down here, 10 to minus four, it's about 900 times faster. So it's that, so that caught my attention. Um, and also as, as a side note, I remember around 1990, uh, JPL was working on a memory 14 uh, convolutional code and they, they uh, and the decoder that they called the big Viterbi decoder. And I asked both uh, Steve Wilson and Dariush 
um, why didn't they use a, a, a Spano? And they, they actually both came back with basically the same answer. Turns out Spano has problems for really long messages. So, you know, back then they liked to stream uh, messages rather than packetize them. And of course, this is a very short packet. And and I looked around and there, all the simulations I could find, not, not that many, had short messages for Fano. So that's okay, because right now we're interested in Fano. And I also ran into this paper by Jordan in 1966, and he says that um, rethink is required for long messages. So they'd periodically insert zeros. Anyway, that's, that's a side note. But anyway, I, I hope this is imp as impressive to you as it is to me. I'll take a hundred times faster any day. Okay. So again, before my outline, I just wanted to go over the assumptions and al algorithms throughout this talk. So I'm concerned only with non-recursive, non-systematic convolutional codes, and in fact, rate one half. And I'm using the notation of UCLA. So V is the memory of the convolutional code. M is the degree of the CRC polynomial. And then it's, we're going to talk about NK codes. So the, really, there's are convolutional codes that become block codes. And so this, these are the block code parameters. Here's the standard notation for code rate. And then ZTCC is, stands for zero terminated convolutional codes. So the initial and final states are both all zeros. And, it, and then it requ requires, of course, a tail of V zeros after the data block. And that's this overhead that we'd like to avoid for uh, sh short message blocks that we're talking about. And then TBCC is, is tail biting convolutional code. And that means that the initial and final state are equal. And of course, usually non-zero. And it requires a look ahead to the final V bits in the data block so that you can match the initial state to the final state. And lastly, LVA is the list of the Turby algorithm. So this is the outline of the talk. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'm just going to present two slides on some recent results on short codes, in particular for a message block of size 64 and um, a code rate of exactly rate one half in both cases. Um, and then um, to pro provide some context to where I'm headed, provide some uh, results on near rate one half codes with a message block size of 150. Um, and then I, in, my, um, in my abstract for the talk, I, I mentioned I'm gonna do a FANO algorithm tutorial. I, I hope I have enough time. I mean, I'm gonna try to fit, fit this all in. I, I think I can do that. Um, and then um, as uh, Rick mentioned, what we'd like to do is get rid of that zero termination overhead and so um, I wanted to focus on the FANO algorithm, which is supposed to be, which is fast, but FANO algorithm for tail biting. And um, here's a sort of a common sense approach that I came up with based on wraparound Viterbi algorithm. Um, and then this is a, an algorithm that I found in the literature uh, published by Shi Shang. Um, that I'll talk to you about, and then some open problems. Okay, so again, some notable results for K equals 64, message size 64. Um, so this is a memory 14 code with these parameters um, with a wraparound Viterbi algorithm decoder published in this famous paper here. Um, and so you can see the code I care about in this plot is this mem memory 14 TBCC, and that's got these marked by these uh, squares. Okay, and you can see it's right up against this random coding union bound, which is the green curve. And in fact, it's less than 0.05 dB to the RCU bound at a frame error rate of 1E minus 4. And again, all my plots are going to be frame error rates and EV over and zero. Okay, so I didn't bother to measure how close it is. It's, it's less than 0.05 dB. And then this is another famous paper by the UCLA group head, headed by Rick. Again, same parameters. And um, 
the curve we care about is this purple one and the RCU bound is uh, this dashed curve. Um, oh, I should mention the memory size is eight. This is a 10-bit CRC, the lisp viterbi algorithm decoder. And again, the gap is less than 0.05 dB to the RCU bound at FER equals one E minus five. And I, I think it's, especially for this audience at UCLA, everyone knows what the lisp viterbi algorithm is, but just in case for completeness, I'm just gonna mention, um, it involves first CRC encoding into a usually a rate one half code, uh, tail biting convolutional code. And on the decode side, there's not just a Viterbi decoder, but it's a list Viterbi decoder that produces a list of candidate code words um, ordered in terms of likelihood. And so you go down the list from the most likely on down and check if it passes CRC. And the first one that passes CRC, that's your decoder decision for anyone who might not know what the list Viterbi algorithm is. Okay, so those are results for K equals 64, but at work, we're, I was more interested in um, message sizes of 150, say to 250. Um, for products that we have for our customers. Um, 64 is not enough. And I experimented with the FANO algorithm, but I, and I also um, used the CRC combined with the tail bite and convolutional code. And I didn't have software like uh, UCLA does to uh, optimize the CRC, but I played with a few of CRCs and and I got, you know, 0.60 B away, not 0.05 now, 0.60 B away from say the normal approximation. And so I told Rick about it and, and he offered uh, Hong Jay's services who um, said he could design an optimal CRC for me because I, I didn't put in an optimal CRC, but I knew the CRCs that I was using were near optimal. And so with the, this is what Hong Jay sent me. Again, it's 150 bit message, mess, uh, memory eight, CRC 10, list the Turbi algorithm. And this is the performance. And then, so there's no 0.05 dB anymore now that the message size is 150 and this is the RCU bound. Um, and so I think Hong Jay came up with the, the, the best explanation for it. So we, we increase the message size. The first thing that does for convolutional code is it increases the multiplicity, right? And so the multiplicity went up, but also for message sizes of 150, the minimum distance should go up. Um, and the minimum distance doesn't go up, right? It's a convolutional code, just because you uh, increase the message size. But if you consider the ensemble of code with these parameters, 320 and 150, it should go up and that this accounts for it, this, um, but it didn't go up. So the multiplicity, multiplicity went up and then the D min did not go up. And, and I think that's the explanation for this, but if, if anyone wants to add to that, um, maybe later. I, I mean, okay. I, I think we just need a longer CRC or a more or more memory elements, but to, prune out okay. more of the, anyway, that's, that's I, just conjecture, but, but. I, that, yeah, I, longer CRC to get a larger minimum distance, that, what you mean? Okay, that, uh, yeah, I don't, I wouldn't argue with that. Um, and, then, and maybe a lot of decoding, large list, maybe, maybe too. Okay. <clears throat> So I told you I was playing with the FANO and I wanted to see what the FANO could do. And I didn't know how to do FANO for tail biting. Um, so I applied FANO to uh, zero terminated. So a message size 150 and over here is the memory for the zero terminated convolutional code. So, and this one's not optimal. I did sort of a, a non-exhaustive search and I got one that I know is a very good code. 
um, applied fan onto it and I got this curve, the red one, uh, the red curve. Okay, <clears throat> and then this is the same code as uh, Hongjae gave me. It's just, I used my simulator because I wanted to get this other information. Okay, and you can see that this is kind kind of interesting. They they have roughly the same rate. They're different rates because this is not tail biting, um, but it's about the same performance, about the same rate. Um, and but I again I have to point out the Fano is not 900 times faster or 250 times faster, but it is a lot faster this time um, than that list for Turbi algorithm. And it, again. Part of the reason I'm very interested in Fano. I mean, I'll take 10 times faster any day. Um, same performance. And then um, I list the average list sizes for each case. And you can see it, it, it has similar behavior. I don't know what Hongjays would be here um, or, or Ethan's or someone else's simulation. But anyway, you can see it goes down to an average list size of just above one. As, Which is because that's, I mean, once you're down at uh, the very low frame error rates, it's almost that that's the behavior that we've seen is that the list size yeah, is about one. That's right. Yeah. And I just wanted to give you some confidence that, that I'm, that these are reasonable numbers. These are believable numbers, I should say, 17 times, 140 times, and so forth. And, and my list decoder, as, as Rick knows, is. What it is, is that I have a module that's a parallel list for Turby algorithm. And then I call it with a list size of one. And if it fails, then I call it with list size of two. And if that fails, I call it with list size of four. So it's sort of hybrid serial parallel is, is what I call it. Um, but it, it, it has this performance. And as Rick mentioned, most of the time, you, you only need a list size of one or two down here where you plan to operate. But occasionally, you need you do need the, the larger list sizes to get this kind of performance. Okay. So again, I, I want to get rid of uh, this um, loss due to the zero termination. Right? There's 19 zeros that I had to insert here. And so that's where I'm headed, and um, since I figured the, the UCLA group is uh, not that familiar with the FANO algorithm. I thought I'd give a tutorial uh, the, the best I can in the few minutes that I have. And, and so this is the first <laughs> slide. And I just wanted to say this doesn't get used, <laughs> sort of. It, it, I sort of use it, at least in the back of my mind. But it, it, it doesn't involve a trellis. It involves a tree, which many or all of you have seen. And I'll explain the tree just in case someone in the audience hasn't seen it this way. Um, so this, I just picked an example code. I don't use this code for my simulations, and so you've all seen this code. And the way to construct the, the tree is initialize to all the zero state, and then if a if a zero goes into the encoder, then you go upward and you read off, you know, the, the output bit. And if a one goes in to the encoder, then you go downward. And so if it's all, if, I don't know, a string of zeros, then you go up and then up and up, and that would be your output. But if it's something like a, a zero and then a one and then a zero, then you'd read off those bits and those would be output bits for the encoder and, and similarly, similarly down here. And by the time you have put K bits into the encoder, you're out here at, at all the leaves. And so there will be as many leaves as, as there are messages, as there are code words. And so, so you don't actually store this, you store this information. In fact, the way I store it is I just store the trellis information. Um, but you imagine um, using this in the FANO decoder. And in fact, um, I can give you an idea what happens. So you, you receive a, let's talk about the hard decision. You receive a, a, the code word from the output of the channel. And let's say it has a few errors. I think it would be easy to convince you that you can make it through this and find the right code word 
um, if there were only a few errors, right? You just do some hamming bit or hamming distance, excuse me, hamming distance comparisons and you can make it through here. Okay, but then when, what, what are, happens when there are a lot of errors? Um, you, you, what happens is you're gonna find yourself trapped, like, okay, it's not, things aren't looking good and then you have to back up. And so what, that's what the FANO algorithm does and it's, a, it's an ingenious algorithm um, for making it through the tree and it involves a, a, a dynamic threshold that helps you figure out whether or not you should back up. And so I'll say a, a little bit more about that. I took these lines, so I'm gonna explain the FANO algorithm in three different slides and you can stop me if it's too much, Rick. Um, Let's see how much time. Okay. Okay. Um, so I took. I, I think I this, is, uh, this will have lasting value, Bill, for us. So we're, you know, remember it's recorded. Okay. Lots of people will watch it. I'm really so happy I'll, you're doing it. Okay. Okay. So I'll go through it. Um, so this, I was going to go through it three different ways. I like the way Dan Costello uh, described it verbally, and so I kind of stole. His his some of his lines from his book, but there's a Fano metric which I'm not going to explain. But there's a here's a one reference on that, so the, the reference that everyone mentions, and it, and it looks like this. Okay, um, so anyway, it, the reason why it's Fano metrics involved is based one reason is you're you're going through that tree one path at a time, unlike. Viterbi, where there are two to the V paths that you're examining all at once, you go on one, one path at a time. And so you need this little bias term, it, it turns out, um, which, and that's as far as I'm going to explain that. But I'll, I'll explain um, the, the, most of the FANO algorithm beyond that. Okay, so as I mentioned, it steps forward through the tree, but sometimes it has to go backwards. And, and I'll explain that, but it's, it goes backwards when, it, when um, it's not, it doesn't compare well with, with the threshold. It's not working well with the threshold. Okay, and so it goes forward and backwards on the basis of, of course, there's gonna be a cumul cumulative metric comparison with a threshold and it's a dynamically changing threshold. Okay, um, second, if the, cumulative metric is greater than the threshold, then it steps forward to the next branch. So it, it moves, makes a move forward. Otherwise, if that metric is, is not greater than the threshold, it actually looks back to the previous metric. And if it's greater than that threshold, then it moves back, right? And, and you can imagine like you're going through here and then you find things aren't working out. You can imagine you might wanna move back and try this path, right? That's the type of thing that goes on there. Um, and then if the, and if the look back metric is greater than the threshold, um, and the, deco, the threshold is decremented and the look, for, the look forward sequence begins again. Um, but this time an alternative path is taken. And I, I basically just said that. Um, and it turns out that um, part of the ingenious part of the FANO algorithm is each time a, a node is visited in the forward direction, um, because you might revisit, you might go down and that it fails and you go over this way and then it fails again and you might go back again. But if you go back again, it doesn't make sense that, that you have the same threshold because you'll get stuck in an infinite loop. So Fano has arranged it so that if you revisit a node in that tree, the threshold is lower. It's guaranteed to be lower than it was on the previous visit. Okay, and that way you, you uh, and eliminate the possibility of an infinite loop. And then that path, uh, I mean, excuse me, the path that reaches the end of the tree, that's the decoded path. Okay, and so, stop using my mouth. Okay, so I, I created this uh, flow chart based on uh, what I learned from Wozencraft and Jacobs and Lynn Costello. And, um, I'm gonna go through most of it and then I'm gonna give you an example. But basically there's a, there's a forward part of the flow chart and there's a backward moving part, right? I mentioned we go forward and we go backward. And obviously 
we'd like to do this, go down and then around and around. And that's what happens for high SNR. You just keep going in this loop. But obviously where we usually operate, you're gonna to have to go backward occasionally. Okay, but um, I'm gonna go through this to some extent and then I'm gonna give an example um, also from Rosencraft and Jacobs. And so you start the threshold at zero and then you, this flag here is basically a flag that tells you, um, I, am I in the backward moving mode or not? So you set that flag to zero because you're going to, you, you plan to move forward. Obviously you're at the origin node and then N is the number of bits, I guess. Yeah, and so you, uh, let's see, well, you compute the, the metric, right? You get the received bits excuse me, the received channel output corresponding to these first two bits, and you compute a metric, and you compare it to the threshold. Okay, and if it's greater than the threshold, then you go ahead and move forward. And then of course you store that input bit, you know. Um, let me see. And then there's something I just missed. You, you look forward to the best node. So you, so you compute both of these metrics, the metric for, going up and the metric for going down. And then whichever one's the better, the larger metric, that's the direction you go, okay? Um, so that's what this means, look forward to the best node, the one that had the larger metric. So you compare that larger metric to the threshold. And if it's greater, yes, then you move forward. Um, and then of course you store that input bit. Was it a one, did you go up? I mean, did you go down or did you go up? You store that input bit. Of course, if it's the end of the tree, you stop. Um, and then this is the part of the tree <laughs> that has to do with whether or not you've visited a node before, and I am actually going to have to skip it. <laughs> okay, but this is um, this is sort of the magic, and Fano figured out a way. Some books just say, "Did you visit the tree? Did you visit this node before?" And they don't tell you how. You know that. Well, this is how you tell um, this check here, and I'm not going to get into it, but this, um, so you, you need to know whether you visited a node before eventually. I'm sorry, but I'm going to skip it. Okay, so anyway, you move forward, and then um, if that metric is so large that there's room to increase that threshold, then you increase that threshold. You, if the threshold is multiples of this increment delta, then you make K so large um, that it's you know just less than your current metric all right so you you, you now have a cumulative metric but um but and and you and so you want but you want that threshold to be up against it and i'll show you that in a, in, a, in, a, in two slides i'll show you that but you want to con continue to increase that threshold okay and um anyway so the largest case such that the, the, your cumulative metric is just greater than the, or equal to the threshold. Okay, and then you'd like to keep going around like and around, but occasionally this is not gonna be true. Your metric's not gonna be greater than the threshold, so you go this way. And if you go, if, the, if it's at the origin, then you're, you're kind of stuck. And whenever you're stuck, you decrease the threshold. Okay, and then you go back again. Otherwise you come back this way and then you look, you look backward. Why do you look backward? Well, you couldn't go forward, <clears throat> right? That's why you came this way. So you look backward. And is this guy, um, the backward metric greater than the threshold? If it's not, then you, there's definitely a threshold problem. You have to decrease it. And then you go this and you start all over again. Okay, otherwise you look backward. Oh, the backward guy is better than the threshold. And that, that must still be a pretty good one. So you move backward. Um, and then the thing about move, from the second branch, that has to do with this, what I talked about. I said, whether it's here at the beginning or here and here, you compute two metrics, two cumulative metrics, and you go in the direction of the one that's greater. You choose that one first, but sometimes you get stuck. And so then you have to try the second one. And so that's, that's what this one, you, you, you're keeping track um, you, of whether you came from that second branch. And up here, this says, look forward to the best node. 
But if you came from A right here, this point A, then you do the next best node. You do that other one. Remember, there's I'm talking about a rate one over two or rate over n toes. So there's just only two two uh, paths you can go. You first try the the best one, and if not, then then you then you go back and try the second one. So let me <clears throat> it's best to go with an example. See how much. Yeah, I, I have time. So I'm not a go, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I, I'll give you an idea. And but there's enough there for anyone to go through all of it. Yeah, and, and so Rick, I'm glad that you said you and your students are interested in learning. So this is a good way to to start. This is a nice example from Rosencraft and Jacobs, except they they talk about um, I talk about like increasing metrics and they call, talk about decreasing so I, I took their diagram and, and flipped it over they, they had all this going negative <laughs> I feel better going positive so I redrew theirs but this is right out of their book over here okay so <clears throat> excuse me on this axis is the input bit number but that is input to the encoder or, or level into the tree if you want right it's the input and then these are metric values um, and they're just normalized, if you want, by the, that threshold increment delta. And then these are the threshold levels, zero, and then one, and two, and then minus one. Or if you want, you could say it's two delta, one delta, minus one delta, right? But it's all normalized, so obviously, for, for convenience. And so <clears throat> you start at the zero node in the tree, you set the threshold to zero, this parameter theta is zero. And then the idea here is you compare these two metrics, that one and that one. Well, this direction is metric level, right? Metric values, it says right here. So obviously this metric is greater than that, so you go that way, okay? And so you look at one, remember, you look here in the, Flow charts just look forward. You don't move there. You just look at it. And you look at one and they go, is it greater than the threshold? Well, the current threshold, as you can see in this column, is zero. So yes, it's greater. So you move to one. So so far, so good. Okay. Um, and then the next two metrics are this one up here, right? That level is a metric value, and this is the other metric level. Well, that's greater. So you look to two. So you look at two. <clears throat> oh, it's, it, it's greater um, than that threshold of zero, right? It was still zero. So if it's greater, that metric is greater than move to two. Bill, okay. can I ask a quick question? Yeah. The red numbers, are those the state identifiers or? Uh, they they're just identifiers that when um, Wozencraft and Jacobs and I are using just so I can give it a name. Com that it's completely a name. That's it. I'm not. Oh, of that right, no. I'm not gonna, it's it's a particular that? state at a particular time. We'll just think of it as node twelve or node three. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, but I do have diagrams like this that involve states that I'll show you. Uh, but th in this case, no, I didn't pay attention. We're not paying attention to state. It's I didn't tell you what, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, I didn't tell you if this is a zero bit or that's a one bit. I'm just, it's, this is greater, that's greater. Okay, good question. So, so then um, we looked at two, it was greater than the threshold, so we moved to two, but there's also this part, and I told you I'm skipping this, and it's, it's definitely not relevant uh, right now. I, I said, you got to tighten the threshold, right? Because at this point, when I move to two, um, I need the multiple of, of uh, this increment delta that's just less than this level. Well, right now our threshold was zero. So I need to increment it so that the threshold's up here. So it's just less than, this is not tight enough. So I need to tighten the threshold. So I increment it by delta. Okay, so we set, T equals delta now. That's so that's the new threshold. So now we're we move to two, we're here at two, and then again two has creates, we look out and then has two different cumulative metrics, that one and that one. 
for a one and a zero. Um, so while this is the greater one, so you look at three, um, well, three is greater than the threshold. Remember the threshold is one right there. Uh, so you move to three. Okay, now three has two metrics, that cumulative metrics or extensions, four and seven. Well, you go to the one that's the greater. You look at four, uh-oh, it violates the threshold. The threshold is here. Okay, so that's what that X means. So that means you have to look back and that's this part. It violated the threshold, that's this way. Um, and so you have to look back. And so we look backward and you ask, is the metric greater than the threshold? Oops, wrong direction. And so you, um, so you look back at two, right? Because we're at three and we, tr we tried four and well, that violates the threshold. So you have to look back at two. Um, and two doesn't violate the threshold, so you move to two. Okay, and so I'm 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 about ready to wrap this up because I think you'll get you're getting the point, and you can do the rest. But so but see, this is that thing that I haven't covered yet. That, so I we went this way to the better one, and now we have to go to the second best one, and that's this part of the flow chart. Remember, next best node. So we we came we came we moved backwards. And then we came through here, we came from point A. So you go to the next best node if you came from point A. Um, and, uh, and so that's five. And so no, how come five. you didn't try, when you went from four back to three, cause it went the wrong direction. How come you didn't go down and try seven, like the next best node when you went back just once? Because seven is all note is uh, I'll say obviously worse. That was the best one. So seven has to be worse. Remember, we're, we we try sure. we first try the best one by extension of of three. If four didn't pass, seven's definitely not going to pass. Does that makes sense. I know, but I, I I okay. I have to think about it some more because I feel like you could also say that about going back to two, that we know it's gonna be worse than its branch, you know, so, but I guess I'll, I'll, I'll think about that later. Okay, yeah, but that, anyway, that's the answer. It's, it's, it's definitely worse. Uh, and so you, so you go back, um, and where was I? Oh yeah, you looked at four, violated, so you look back at two, two is greater, than the threshold. And so you move back to two. And so then now you look at five, you go this way. Um, it violates the threshold. Um, and so, you, so you, you're, you're over here now, oops, gosh. You're over here, so you have to decrease the threshold. Okay, and then, um, and then you have to anyway go back and look at one. Why is that? I'm sorry. You came from the second branch. And then so now I'm actually lost. So you, anyway, you have to move back, you look back at one. Oh, it, it gets violated. And then you have to I'm lost. Anyway, sorry. Let me just keep going. I think you guys can figure this out with this. I'm trying to match this up with that. And I think you got most of it. And anyway, that's as much time as I wanted to spend on that. Okay. Okay. So back to Fano and Viterbi, and I'm still zero terminated. I just wanted to show you more data. I won't spend much time on this, but I didn't give speed because I already showed you speed, but Fano is much faster. And then I just want to show you for these memory sizes, Fano is, um, has the same performance, except I noticed this. I simulated for 400 error events, 400 block errors, and I, I, I can't get lower than this, and I don't know what it is for this memory size. So I, I think that's interesting. It could, it could be something uh, that I'm doing. I'm not gonna say there's a bug, because <laughs> I don't think there is. But, it, but you're, saying you get, you're saying you get a slightly worse frame error rate just for V equals six. Just for V equals six, thank you, yes. And all these other ones I simulated a long time, and. Fit me, uh, nearly the same. Okay, so I'm still headed towards tail biting. I just wanted to in, insert one more last plot. This is again that memory 19 code with a, 
message sizes of 150, zero termination, and I'm plotting its frame error rate versus uh, EP over in zero for that code, zero termination, and plotting it against normal approximation. And there's that, uh, let's call it 0.6 dB at and, and over 0.67 dB. Um, but the one thing I did, I didn't do this calculation for you, so I thought I'd insert it here. The coding rate loss is the loss you suffer by not going to, you know, a tail biting where this would be 300. So the tail, the, the loss is the 338, the extra bits you have to use relative to 300. So it's 0.52 dB. So if we can get rid of this code rate light, code rate loss due to zero termination, um, we can get a lot of this back, right? Most of this back, if we could. I uh, just want to just quickly show you some nice curves. So this is the, the, what the metrics look like versus input bit number. And it, it basically, I just want to show you that it's back tracing or retreating through the tree. Right, and then it's it, and then eventually it's a lot of backtracing. Obviously, there was high noise here, but eventually it makes its way. Okay, um, and then the, the orange or whatever that color that is, or red. This is this is the uh, the dynamic threshold, and you can see it it keeps being adjusted, so it's it's just less than the current metric. But I just wanted to show you that. And then this is a different thing. This is, it's basically the path through the trellis because this is state number and this is input bit number. And this is, I don't think I said the last one was memory eight. This is memory eight for, for these code parameters. And so it does this and you can see it like here, it goes out here and then it backs up and a couple other places here, it goes out here and it backs up and it goes out here and it backs up. And so you can see some of that going on. Um, and that's that, I don't know, the error rate here was in the ballpark of 1e minus 3. This is the memory 19 code, and sometimes it makes it through without much trouble. And this is a pretty low uh, signal noise ratio. I, again, the error rate, I don't know, was in the ballpark of 1e minus 3. I don't, I, I don't know, 2 dB. Yeah, so the, 2 the dB. Relative to the term. Pardon me? The speed up relative to Viterbi is the Viterbi is basically traversing. Well, it doesn't all traverse that. all the paths, but it does traverse, you know, uh, a path for each state all the time. You know, whereas Fano yeah. really is only traversing the best path plus these little twigs uh, that it yeah, and when it has to back up, and That's it right. so that feels good. I mean, it you know. I guess Viterbi is sort of systolic in the sense that my data structures are constant. Whereas Fano, I've got loops or backing up. And so I have to think, I think this is something I want Chester to think about is can we put it in an FPGA or does it get too complicated? Um, but then the, the other thing that's neat about it is it is a natural list decoder because when you get to the end, if yeah. that doesn't check the CRC, well, you would just, lower the threshold and back up and you'll find the next one, right? That's kind of the key. I, I agree. You could think of it as a list decoder. I haven't gone farther than that though in terms of trying to make it into an actual list decoder, but that's like a, a to-do list or for you guys. <laughs> no, but uh, anyway. So, oh, so you have not implemented a FANO list decoder? I have not. I was trying to like, let's make the memory size that's really large, yeah, so good question. So let me go back to this. Look, would I need a list decoder if I could just get rid of this coding rate loss? I don't. Oh, you're just saying you're just saying if I make it tail biting, I'm done. That's right. That's right. But but in my open problems, I do mention let, let's use it as a list decoder. But you're saying this is a solution. So I guess the big research problem, let's talk about what actually matters. The real research problem here is I want to send 150 bits and I want to be as close to the RCU bound as, um, as we can. We can do it two ways now 
for 64 bits. I can either do uh, a V equals 14 uh, tail biting convolutional code, or I can do a V equals eight code with 10 bits of CRC. Either and listen. That's right. Either way, yeah. Works. Except, except your second one's a lot faster. It runs a lot faster than than. So good for you, right? Uh, yours runs a lot faster than that wave of the port, a memory fourteen. Right, I but does you, I, you? But if you run it with Thano, do you then that would, hopefully would be faster still, right? So you're saying, okay, this is not about list decoding. This is about we don't need the list decoder. Just get Thano working for tail biting, and it's done. That was my original goal, yes. I agree, 100%. But, but, I, but I, in my open problems, Wait, Stephen, I Stephen, go ahead, Stephen. I, I don't see a natural way to do list decoding with Thano. Um, if you did the stack algorithm, ZJ algorithm, some people call it, then you, you do have a, a list sort of at the end of the, of the cycle, I guess, once you reach the end. But I think the way Bill's describing, you go to the end, then then you might check a CRC. If it doesn't pass, then you repeat the Thano, maybe with a modified threshold, right? Oh, you couldn't just back up. Like I I was thinking, if you got to the end, you would pretend like that last branch didn't work, even though it did, and back up and try a new branch and essentially so generate your list that way. There might be a way. I don't know the algorithm. I don't know. Yeah. It seems to me that, that you could track not just one path, but all the ones that comply with, with a slightly looser threshold. So yeah. it might be a little bit more complex, but. Uh, yeah, but then you'd have to sort them as you go. Yeah. yeah. Interesting question, though. But yeah, I, I, yeah it's all interesting. Uh, I mean, Bill, uh, uh, the RCU, you didn't plot RCU. This nor usually RCU is higher than normal approximation. This is normal yeah. approximation, right? It's normal approximation, yes, because I, I don't have that software. UCLA does. So it's, it's you, uh, Dario, it's usually within about 0.1 dB, you think? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, usually UCLA compares with RCU, right? That's uh, correct. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't do that because I don't the normal it. approximation is you know below RCU. I don't know how much. That it's nice to have the RCU here also compare. Yeah. We can. Uh, but anyway, I'm within 0.1 dB. Do you agree? Yeah. RCU sum. sum. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that should be it. Uh, the, RCU now down my, here. my question is you consider only in your simulation 150 bit input block size. Have you considered 100 or 200 to see the differences in performance versus uh, for a given uh, frame error rate? I mean, there is a, some best point, uh, best uh, input size that gives best performance, I guess. Oh, for, for this given code. Yeah, suppose yeah, that if, uh, you fix the frame error rate and versus the input block size. So uh, there is some uh, optimum point that gives you the best performance from the theoretical result. That's good. I didn't think of that. What I was thinking for this 150, there's some best memory size. That's, I which see. Is actually, but but, but I, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I could, right? I actually yours is easier to do, right? Just fix on the code and then play. Yeah, yeah. and change, uh, you know, the input block size for keeping yeah. the same uh, code rates. Uh. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I, I, I guess that's related to this idea. In my head, I think of each convolutional code as having a natural block length, which is related to that Anderson traceback depth. Um, and that sort of the natural length that it's able to spread things out. And that might be related to what, I, well, what I guess what Darius is saying is we could just compute the RCU bounds and find the one that is the most favorable. Hey, Rick, do I have to stop at 10 o'clock? Because I, it's, uh, I better, well, I better get going. Well, how about if we, we're gonna let people who wanna leave at 10 go, but we can, you can go for a few more okay. minutes.
Yeah, I want you to get through your talk. Yeah, I'm not through it. I better get going. But th thanks for all the questions and comments. I just want to show that one, memory 19. So 2DB, it could look like that for memory 19, it can look like that, but it still made it through. That This was a correct code word. Wow. OK. okay. And then this is something um, relevant. So for a catastrophic convolutional code, um, Viter with zero termination, Viterbi has no problem really, but I just checked and Fano does. And it's, it's somewhat relevant to what we're doing, Rick, because, well, for zero terminated convolutional code, this, is, this can be considered to be uh, catastrophic. Yes, right? absolutely. But then what, yeah. when it's tail biting, it's not. But anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Okay, so I'm finally getting to the, try to do, apply Fano to tail biting. And this, it actually should be easy. So these are two papers I found. This one's well known, the wraparound Viterbi algorithm. And then I found this nice paper, wraparound BCGR. You mentioned Anderson a second ago. Um, and for those of you who don't know, it's basically you initialize the state metrics to zero. And for tail biting, you think of the trellis like that. So you initialize these to, to zero, and then you go through the trellis a couple of times. And each time you use as your initial metric, the final metric from the previous pass. And you do that a few times. And then you choose as your tail biting path, excuse me, choose as your decision, the tail biting path with the maximum cumulative metric. So that's all I'll say about that. And so I, I tried to mimic that. I'm calling it a wrap around Fano algorithm. You start at state zero, right? So it's a TBCC, but you don't know where, what state the encoder started in, but you just go ahead and start at state zero. And you run through two periods of the tree. So you imagine a tree that's sort of periodic like that. You run through two periods of the tree and after two periods, um, you, you get some final state after the two periods. Well, you make that your initial state for a third pass through the tree. And, and that's all I did. And so um, for these memory sizes, again, there's that 1.2 from memory size six. A memory size eight, the, the Fano versus Viterbi FER ratio, um, is nearly one here as memory size gets larger, um, it, it starts moving away from the turby until this, this case, it's, it's, an, it's not that good. I mean, even that one's not that good. Um, and I, my explanation is for the wraparound Viterbi algorithm, you only have to, by doing those passes, you only have to get a distribution, a metric distribution that's favorable to the correct state. You don't even have to find the correct state. You just have to have a metric that's favorable to it. Um, and then it'll it'll work out. This With this wraparound FANO algorithm, you actually have to find the correct state or you're not gonna succeed. Okay. Um, and then worse, the news gets worse is this wraparound FANO algorithm is 10 times slower than the wraparound Viterbi algorithm. So that didn't, doesn't work out. And then there's this Toronto Fano algorithm. It's this paper that I found by Xi Shang and his students. Um, and this paper, unfortunately, doesn't even mention the algorithm. They just mentioned some results. As, as, I guess it was obvious to them, but it wasn't obvious to me. And so I communicated with the student. And the, the way this works is you start with the generator matrix for the tail biting convolutional code. And then you, using Gauss elimination, you created an upper triangular uh, echelon form, we'll call it GE, from this tail biting matrix. And then um, you obtain the, the decoding tree from that echelon form matrix. And then they use the stack algorithm, but I'm gonna use the FANO algorithm because my FANO decoder is a lot faster than my stack decoder. And so this is the memory six case here. Um, this is the uh, tail biting generator matrix for memory six. Um, 
and you apply Gauss elimination and you can get this um, upper echelon form. And I just wanted to point out, um, you get an irregular tree because it, as you can see, the, the inset, sort of the, uh, the inset from one row to the next is just one. Like here, we're used to an inset of two so that you label, uh, never mind, you label the tree branches with two bits. Like that's what you would do here, but here you label the branch with one bit and then eventually you label with two bits because you can see the inset is two as in a normal generator matrix for a convolutional code. Um, let's see, um, there's an issue with this. So what happens is as, as you, so th these represent input bits and you're trying to estimate these. And as you, as you start decoding the tree way out here in branch 120, let's say, these old decisions come into play. That's the zero as U1, U2, U3. And if they're wrong, they're gonna throw off the decoding. So it, it creates problems. Um, and similarly here for memory 14, it's, there's the tail biting, here's the echelon form matrix. And you can see it, it's, it's a mess. But the reason why you use this, by the way, is this is causal. I don't know if you think about it, this, this and this, these are, these are causal. So as you're decoding, whereas you try to decode this, um, try to decode that first bit U1, well, it depends on the values of U64, U63 and so forth. And so by going from here to here, you, you created a causal situation. Okay. <clears throat> And so this is anticlimactic because um, for memory six, um, the FER ratio is, again, it's about the, in this case, it's not 1.2, it's 1.3 at 4.2 dB. Um, and then the speed is extremely slow. So the speed of the fan overs is the wave is 0.2. So it's, it's five times slower here, it's 10 times slower. Um, and then, Leon and Chi Shang, um, they have, they noticed that theirs was slow, and they proposed an alternative metric to speed up the, the decoding. Um, and so they proposed this metric, and I played with that, but I, I don't have any results with it just yet. And so here here are some open problems. So I'm, I need I'm being to... sorry, I have to leave because I have a presentation. But uh, Steve, uh, very great pleasure to seeing you here. Uh, the, I guess the first time we met was uh, 43 years ago in John Hopkins, the first conference that I participated. Oh, you're, you're on mute. Hi, David. Your, your memory is better than mine, Darius. <laughs> Again, very great to see right. you. Yeah. Okay. okay, bye. And after our meeting yesterday. Um, Do we have a meeting, uh, Rick, we this afternoon? That, uh, we were using to infer what the carrier tower was. Um, Rick, he's asking if you, you have a meeting with him. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't hear. Uh, I think he's left, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess he'll ask you later. Yeah, yeah we'll be in touch. Okay. So, so open some up. So, Real quick. Question, question. Why, oh, why, is, why is the Toronto algorithm so much slower? Is it because it's the stack algorithm? Or... Is there something else, the irregular tree? Or... Oh, I'm not, yeah, I'm using Fano. I'm calling it Toronto Fano. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, I think it has trouble sorting itself out. Like, um, like I, I, I mentioned here, so you're, yeah, um, still... you're, you're relying on past decisions and if they're ever wrong, um, then it, I don't know, it throws things into a tizzy. I, I don't have a, a great explanation on that. But in fact, it has trouble at the outset um, getting going because even this relies on past decisions and it has trouble, um, but I need to explore more. But it, um, I, I asked uh, the, the Toronto student um, about this memory 14 and, and he also 
said, yeah, that we, we haven't tried it. And I, he says he could see why it would be a problem. And I think it's because you're relying on past decisions to make current decisions. And these might be wrong yet. These might be wrong. And so I don't know. It throws the algorithm in, into a tizzy. So um, I, I want to examine their metric for speeding up further. I, I still want to you know, try to get a stable, fast decoder for TBCC code. Um, I, I'm interested in this catastrophic situation. And then this was what uh, I guess Steve said earlier, use the stack. It's a natural list decoder, but mine's slow compared, much slower than the FANO. So for those of you who can create a fast stack algorithm, this is a natural list decoder. Both of you mentioned that, Rick and Steve, the natural list decoder. And so this, this might be the way to go for using sequential decoding. If you, if you can make your stack algorithm fast. And then the FANO decoder for uh, general linear block codes. And there's, here's one thing that I wanted to mention. These guys, last thing, last slide. So again, for message size 64, this is the uh, polarization adjusted convolutional codes proposed a few years ago. And it seems like er everybody has no problem coming close to that dispersion bound as they're calling it for metric size 64, but you increase the message size to 256, they are, I don't know, 1.5, 1.3 dB away. So, so this is an unsolved problem, right? Once we get to 150, 200, 256. And that, that's all I have, thank you. Wow, well, thanks a lot, Bill. This was really fun. And uh, yeah, it seems like there are so many, it just opens up a lot of new directions for us. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we had this hint earlier when, when we, you worked with Hung Jae and we looked at a 150-bit case, but basically our approach, I guess, like everybody else, like things work at 64 bits, we don't know quite what to do with 150 to get the same level of performance. And what you're saying is, one thing's for sure, if you could do an efficient tail biting, uh, if you could do efficient decoding of a tail biting convolutional code with a lot of states, then you're there. Or it seems like that's a solution. Um, that, that's right. And I, I think that um, I feel like there should be, the way I, under, the way I understand the world, basically uh, having our tail biting convolutional code with a smaller number of states plus a CRC is essentially another way of getting that complexity. And so in a sense, it's not surprising that with the same CRC, we perform similarly bad to the same tail biting convolutional code, but we can try to have a larger CRC, but that we face problems, not with the, well, maybe with the decoding complexity, but actually, Maybe not if we're able to, um, I guess this is a conversation we were having yesterday that basically if I let go of my uh, demand that we be provably maximum likelihood and let that first run reset the metrics, that might be enough for us to be able to have a decoder that's fast enough, even with when we have a more complicated trellis or a longer CRC, because we can keep the list size down. Um, anyway, so we have parallel research paths that are both interesting. Um, and I can't wait uh, to keep working on this with you. So everybody, let's. I, I think it's time to go to, why don't you turn off your screen sharing? We'll go to the gallery. People can give you some virtual applause. Um, yeah. And thanks a lot. Yeah, it was really great, Bill. Thanks for coming. Um, Thank you. And I'll turn off the recording in, in, a, in a day or two if you, this will be on our webpage for um, a couple of our students I know had class and they'll be able to catch it later. And we'll just keep talking about it. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much for coming, Stephen. I hope that we can talk more about these things. Sure. Uh, so you're going to hang up now, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>